people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has a light shown. You have, have multiplied the nations, you, you have, have increased your glory. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We light the first candle for Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father and our God, we come into your presence with joy today, for you are a great and awesome God. We praise you for your creation. We praise you for your Son, Jesus, who came that we might have life and have it to the fullest. And we praise you for your Holy Spirit who lives in and among us and who enables us to come to you in faith. Lord, may your Spirit enable us this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth, for we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing together our opening hymn of praise, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Please be seated. We're beginning an Advent sermon series today that focuses on those pictures of Christ's birth that we find in the epistles, the letters to the churches. This morning we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 where Paul says that we are to consider Jesus who was rich had all the riches of heaven, and yet for our sake became poor, that we might know God's riches. Our confession of sin this morning focuses on the fact that you and I are often unwilling to empty ourselves of all that we have and to give to others. Let's confess our sin and ask for God's 
forgiveness. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you emptied yourself of your heavenly glory and were born into poverty. We are unwilling to empty ourselves for others and hold on to our possessions too tightly. Forgive us for our greed and selfishness. Awaken in us a spirit of generosity for your sake. Amen. Let's continue to confess our individual sins silently and privately. Let us pray. Amen. One of the paradoxical statements that Jesus made was that I did not come to call the righteous those people who think they are good, but instead I came to call sinners to repentance. We are those people, sinners who have repented, who have confessed their sins, and because of your faith in Jesus Christ, Beloved friends, I declare to you His forgiveness. Amen. We're going to sing our hymn of assurance. I asked a group of people who were kind of gathered in the front earlier, how many of them knew this hymn, Once in Royal David's City? May I see the hands of those who do? Not many. All right, we're going to learn something today. Um, Bev actually played Once in Royal David's City before the service. But we're going to play it through one more time for you to hear. Would you stand? The words will be up on the screen. This hymn was written by a Sunday school teacher, a woman whose name was Cecil Alexander, was teaching a fifth grade Sunday school class, and she wanted them to understand the meaning of Christ coming to the earth. And so she wrote this song once in Royal David City. We'll play it through once, and then we'll sing it.
please be seated. Once again, we've received more prayer requests for healing than we can possibly cover in this time of worship. I'm going to pray a general prayer. I'm going to give some opportunity for you to lift up, in particular, some folks that you know who need to be prayed for, for healing spiritually, physically, and otherwise. I will report to you, thank you for Pastor John Frazier filling in last Sunday. Um, I went, as you know, unexpectedly to Thomasville, Georgia, because my friend Tim Filston, the pastor there, um, went to Duke Medical Center and his wife Beth had very serious surgery for pancreatic cancer. Uh, it did not go as well as they had hoped. Um, they're still waiting on some pathology reports and I'd really like to ask that you remember her in prayer. Um, the complication for that wonderful church, as you know, that donated $70,000 for us to build this building, buy this building. Um, their assistant pastor announced several months ago that he was leaving in January. So Tim is going to be holding down the fort by himself. And uh, we need to pray for that church. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, let us pray. Our Father and our God, this is a time of thanksgiving. And we rejoice that we have so much to be thankful for. We thank you, Lord, that we were fed generously on Thanksgiving Day. We're thankful that we have the opportunity to share with others through Logos and through the Christian Care Center and other ministries that help to feed the poor. Lord, we thank you for family. Some of us are struggling right now because we're not able to see family due to this coronavirus. We pray, Father, that you might provide an effective vaccine that will enable us to get back to living more normal lives. I pray for the 35 members of this church who are not able to attend this morning because of compromised immune systems and concern about the virus. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would touch them as they watch this service. I pray that you would speak to them, Lord, and that you would keep them safe and us safe as well. Father, we pray for our nation. We're going through a time of transition. We're going through a time where it seems as though people are more divided than ever. And Lord, we do pray for peace. We pray, Lord, that we would love even those we disagree with. For Jesus, you told us to love even our enemies. Help us, Lord, to live as one nation under God and to seek your direction, your blessing. We pray for those who were elected to Congress, to the Senate, to President and Vice President. Father God, may you touch them by your Spirit. Lord, we pray for many, many people that we know who are hurting right now. And we pause in silence to each one of us remember someone that we know who needs prayer. Let us pray to the Lord.
Father God, we thank you that you hear our prayers. That if we ask anything according to your will, you hear us. And you will accomplish that which we've prayed about. And we pray in the strong name of Jesus. And let people, God's people say, Amen. Amen. Praise you, sweet little Jesus boy, because we don't do know who you are now. For you have been revealed in your holy word, and your spirit has opened our eyes to behold the very truth of God, that you are God's gift to us, the gift of salvation. And Lord, we ask now that you would receive these gifts that we give as an expression of our thanks to you. For we pray in your name. Amen. Please be seated. Our confession of faith this morning is taken from the Westminster Confession, Chapter 8, Christ the Mediator. This is Article Number 2. Let's read it together. The Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, is truly the eternal God of one substance and equal with the Father. In the fullness of time, He took on Himself the nature of man with all the essential qualities and ordinary frailties of man, except that he was sinless. 
Jesus was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary out of her substance. These two complete, perfect, and distinct natures, the Godhead and the manhood, were inseparably joined together in the one person of Jesus without being altered, disunited, or jumbled. The person Jesus is truly God and truly man, yet one Christ, the only mediator between God and man. Good morning. Good morning. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from the book of Micah, chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. What does the Lord require? With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with birth offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivets of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Christian musician Michael Card coined this phrase, at least he's the first person I ever saw use it, and it's, the term is the power of paradox. A paradox is a seemingly contradictory statement that reveals a deeper truth. We see a lot of uh, paradoxical advertisements. Um, one that I particularly love is by a floral company they say, are you tough enough to, do, to haul flowers? When I grew up in Pittsburgh, there was a, a fund called the, the Press Old Newsboys Fund. And their motto was this, a man never stands so tall as when he stoops to help a child. Again, the power of paradox. Jesus loved paradox. One of his most famous paradoxes is Luke 9, 24, when he says, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. In John, the ninth chapter, 39th verse, Jesus said, I came into the world so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind, referring to the spiritual condition. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the first nine verses, brings a powerful paradox that Christ left the riches of heaven into poverty that we might become rich. Listen, for this is the word of God to us this morning. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that it has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord. Another paradox. Begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but, as, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich for your sake, he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
I believe the big idea in this message is this. That Jesus, who was rich, became poor. That we who are rich might care for the poor. The first example that Paul uses in this passage is the churches of Macedonia. He's referring to northern Greece. The churches of Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea were the churches that Paul had begun there and had ministered. Many of those early Christians were slaves. By definition, had very little. And those who were freedmen were often persecuted so that they weren't able to get the best jobs. The emperor Claudius, who reigned from 41 to 54 AD, particularly persecuted Christians in the economic arena. But Paul tells us that because of Christ's grace, these Macedonian Christians were rich in compassion. He makes a fascinating statement. I sort of uh, gave a little parenthesis as I read it through. It's a paradox. He says, For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. How is that possible that they gave beyond their means? Well, the English translation is a paradox, if not a contradiction, but it's referring to something interestingly that comes from Roman society and from a place where you wouldn't expect it. Roman laws on divorce. You probably know that Hebrew, Greek, and Roman society was extremely chauvinistic. Men rule, women drool. They did not have any rights. Men could divorce their spouses for any reason if she failed to season his food properly. All he had to do was hand her a piece of paper that was called a bill of divorcement and she was gone. Women had no rights, even if they were abused, to divorce their husbands. But Roman law provided for women and children. And the Roman law said that a man was to give Kata dunamin, according to his means. That is, he was to provide for food, clothing, and shelter for his wife and children. But a gracious Roman would provide para dunamin, above his means, meaning that his wife and children would be able to maintain the lifestyle that they had had when they lived with their husband and father. It was unexpected generosity. That's what the Bible loves. Unexpected generosity. Jesus praises one giver in the Gospels, and that's the widow who gives the equivalent of a half a penny. But it was all that she had. Sacrificial giving. These Macedonians not only gave until it hurt, but Paul says that they begged us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. What he's referring to here is the offering that Paul took for the mother church. The church in Jerusalem was suffering more than the Greek churches, the churches in Asia Minor, because there was a famine in Israel and persecution was particularly severe on the Jerusalem Christians. And so Paul was gathering an offering from the Gentiles to bring to these Jewish Christians as a means of uniting the body of Christ. And so these poor Macedonians begged Paul, please allow us to give. Paul says they lived in extreme poverty. Imagine yourself in that situation this Christmas. You're struggling to afford any kind of gift for your family, but you go to our church missions committee and say, please find a needy family for me so that I can 
provide gifts. Why did these Christians have such a passion for giving? Well, Paul makes it clear in verse 5. They gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. When I was in youth ministry, we used to sing a simple chorus. It went like this. I'm yours, Lord. Everything I've got. Everything I am. Everything I'm not. I'm yours, Lord. Try me now and see. See if I can be completely yours. Of course, that sentiment is beyond what any of us can be. Completely the Lord's. But God does want us to consider all that he's given us as a stewardship. R.G. Letourneau, one of my heroes of the faith, started a number of evangelical institutions. He made this statement, I don't ask God, how much of my money should I give to you, Lord? I ask him instead, Lord, how much of your money shall I keep? You see, that's the right question. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that all that we have comes from the Lord. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He is the owner. We are stewards who are called to manage God's resources well. I read a book a while back called who really cares? The surprising thing, the, excuse me, the surprising truth about compassionate conservatism written by Arthur Brooks. The book is full of amazing statistics. The United States has 6% of the world's population, but we consume 40% of the world's resources. Worldwide, there are over a billion people who live on less than the equivalent of $3 a day. 800 million people today will not eat two meals. UNICEF estimates that it would take $20 billion a year to provide clear drinking water, seed, and irrigation to enable a medium-sized African nation to feed its own population. Do you know what we annually spend $20 billion on? Ice cream. <laughs> Ice cream. The average man, woman, and child in America spends about $60 a year on ice cream. I know we will spend at least $60 this year on chocolate mint ice cream, which is <laughs> my wife's favorite. Now, clearly, this isn't a simple problem that can be solved by sending our ice cream money to Africa. But I do believe that God wants us to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. And the good news is that many of us are. Again, Brooks says that people who go to church, listen to this, are 28 times, excuse me, give 28 times more money to charitable institutions than those who don't. And that's not just to the church. Church goers give <clears throat> more money to other charities than unchurched. They are 20% more likely to volunteer at a charity. Church goers even donate blood more frequently than non-church goers. I believe God wants each one of us this Advent to ask this question, Lord, what am I doing in the name of Jesus to meet the needs of others? I want to highlight two opportunities. Many of us got an email this past week from Amy Barty, the founder of Clothed in Hope. She's the granddaughter of Les and Connie Dethridge. Hi, Les and Connie. We love Amy, and we love the ministry that she began. She went on a mission trip to Zambia and she found there families who were destitute. Mothers who were abandoned and who not, could not feed their children and she felt God calling her to do something about it. 
She had a background in fashion. She was offered a very prestigious position in New York in the fashion industry. But instead, she decided to begin Clothed in Hope. She bought sewing machines, and she taught these Zambian women how to sew to create clothing that they could sell. There are dozens and dozens of families who now have a business because of Clothed in Hope. And almost all of those women and their children have come to faith in Jesus Christ. Amy reminded us that this Tuesday is Giving Tuesday. I would certainly encourage you to consider giving to Clothed in Hope. I also want to mention a local ministry, the Christian Care Center. We really believe in what they're doing because like Clothed in Hope, they're not just giving a handout, but they are sharing Christ and meeting needs. People who come to the Christian Care Center for a variety of ministries all hear the gospel and most of them give their lives to Christ and are transformed. It is an incredibly effective ministry. On December 11th, Friday, from 6 to 8, there will be their annual Christmas stroll. If you've never done it before, I want to strongly encourage you to consider being part of that eye-opening experience to see what is being done in the name of Christ for people in need. I feel pretty certain if you do go on that Christmas stroll, you're going to want to contribute to the Christian Care Center. I am not a big fan of Christian cliches. I drove past a church recently that had on its billboard or its sign, brush up on the Bible, prevent truth decay. <laughs> I groaned, and I think that as the unbelievers drive past that, they probably groan loudly as well. Some Christian cliches are downright uh, harmful. Have you ever seen this one? God is my co-pilot. Meaning, I'm in control, but if things really get tough, I will ask him to help out. That's terrible theology. But there's one Christian cliche that I do like. In fact, I don't think it's a cliche, it's a proverb, and it's this. You cannot outgive God. The supreme example of giving in all of history is that sweet little Jesus boy who is the poor little Jesus boy. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Have you ever thought of what it was like for Jesus Christ, who the Bible says flung the stars into space, he was the agent of creation. There was nothing made that was not made by Jesus. He, with the Father and the Spirit, rules the entire universe in heaven. Unlimited power. And yet he's born in a cattle trough. When we lived in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, we bought a house and the previous owner, for some reason, painted the lovely brick with white paint. I think it was a mistake, especially after we moved in and discovered that the soil around our house was particularly conducive to these large black slugs. <laughs> Have you ever seen a slug crawling on the wall, especially one painted white? <laughs> it was disgusting to the max. I had to find two different exterminators that finally were able to get rid of these slugs. C.S. Lewis says, if you want to imagine what it was like for Jesus to become a man, imagine yourself as a slug. That's the gap between deity and humanity. Christ emptied himself for us. 
became the poorest of the poor. It's one thing to be born into poverty. It's something else to choose poverty. I know you all have heard of Habitat for Humanity. It's probably one of the charities that is most subscribed to across the nation. Do you know the story of the man who founded Habitat for Humanity? His name was Millard Fuller. Millard Fuller was a stockbroker in New York City, made millions of dollars. He was an alcoholic. He was cheating on his wife. And then a friend challenged him to go to church with him. Millard Fuller went to Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church and heard the gospel really for the first time. And he gave his life to Christ. And he realized the emptiness that existed. He went on a mission trip to a place called Koinonia Farms in Georgia, America's Georgia. It was a community that was reaching out to the poor in which all of the members pulled their resources together in order to minister to the needy. And Millard and his wife Linda became part of the Koinonia community and from there began Habitat for Humanity, building homes for needy families. Millard Fuller said, my life was nothing. And then in Christ, it became everything when I gave everything away. Habitat for Humanity is just one small expression of the revolution that was begun by Christ's incarnation. He left the riches of heaven for earth so that we on earth might inherit the riches of heaven. John Wesley said the poorest Christian is richer than the wealthiest unbeliever because we have the precious gift of eternal life. And that of course is the greatest gift of Christmas. How do you respond to that gift this morning? If you're not sure that Christ Jesus is your Savior and Lord, I want you to know how much He loves you. He loved you so much that He left heaven to be born in poverty for you. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins and mine. And He rose from the dead that you might have new life. If you don't know Him as Savior and Lord, He's inviting you to accept Him this morning. And to know that abundant life that Millard Fuller and many others have known. If you have made that decision to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, know that gratitude is the only real Christian motivation for giving. We don't buy God's favor. God doesn't love us more because we give. He loves us to the max but out of gratitude for all that He has poured out upon us, we respond with generosity. If you have not received much from God, don't give much. But if you have received much from the Lord, much is expected. He's calling us to excel in the grace of giving. And God wants to do great things through the members of Grace EPC to reach a needy world. May we who are rich in so many ways care for those who are not. Would you pray with me? Father, again, we thank you for the amazing resources that you have poured out upon us as a congregation. Lord, we're facing the possibility of building a new building to reach new people. We ask that you would make us see clearly what is your good, acceptable, and perfect will. And if it is your will to build that building, to give generously, that others may know Jesus. But Lord, we also pray during this Advent time that you would show each one of us how you want us to respond to those in need. 
We ask in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing together our closing hymn, number 192. Would you stand and sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. And let God's people say, Amen. Amen.